question of baptism and who the proper candidates for it are is a question that seemingly will not go away. Credo-Baptists are those who believe that only those who have expressed faith in Christ should be baptized, while Pado-Baptists are those who hold that infants should be baptized as a sign of entrance into the covenant. And when I saw Fred Malone's The Baptism of Disciples Alone, a covenantal argument for Credo-Baptism versus Pado-Baptism, I was interested. Not because I am unsure on the question, but because of Malone's particular history and his theological position. I should note that I hold to a credo-baptist position. Malone is a former paedo-baptist who, while attending Reformed Theological Seminary in Jackson, Mississippi, changed his view on the question. He notes that he baptized two of his infant daughters. However, Malone says that a few years after graduation and when he began pastoring, he studied the issue again and became convinced from the biblical data that only believers should be baptized. Now, some may be thinking that Malone is nothing other than a Reformed Baptist, someone who holds to Reformed doctrine, to covenant theology, except for his position on baptism. You would be correct in that assessment, but what puts Malone perhaps in a category with slightly fewer members is that he held to pedo baptism at one time. He defended it as right, but later became convinced otherwise. Malone begins with a bit of this personal history and then moves to cite those who defend pedo baptism citing theologians like the late John Murray of Westminster Seminary for their defense of the position. A lot of the argument rests on a supposed continuity between the Abrahamic covenant and the New Covenant. And so the argument goes, just as children were made partakers of the covenant and given the sign of circumcision, so we should administer the covenant sign to infants in the New Covenant. Murray draws the correlation between the Abrahamic and the New Covenant, and since there is no explicit revocation of including infants in the covenant, we should expect them to be included, hence infant baptism. This is often summarized by the phrase, by good and necessary consequence, something found in the Westminster Confession of Faith. Malone shows how this can very easily lead to an elevation of one's hermeneutics to be as authoritative as the scriptures themselves. In other words, what to one person is a good and necessary consequence to another lacks any biblical authority. If one makes the consequence binding, then one has indeed given unwarranted authority to interpretation to hermeneutics. Malone shows just how far Murray was willing to take this, saying that since infant baptism is a good and necessary consequence, it is quite indefensible to demand that the evidence required must be in the category of express command or explicit instance. It's a surprising claim to say that requiring explicit scripture to demonstrate a practice is indefensible. Most pedo baptists will admit that we have no clear examples of infants being baptized in the New Testament. Malone moves on to another dean of Reformed theology, Louis Berkhoff, and notes what he feels is an inconsistency. That is, since children were partakers in the Passover meal, should baptized children not partake of the Lord's Supper? From what I have gleaned, pedo-communion is practiced far less than pedo-baptism, but I think Malone raises a good point that if children are indeed made partakers of the covenant by their baptism, then there really is no sound reason why they should be denied communion. On the question of continuity between the Abrahamic covenant and the new, Malone has sympathy with his fellow Reformed theologians. That is, Malone is one who holds to covenant theology. He sees the covenant of works that Adam was under and a covenant of grace that God extends to all of his redeemed. In other words, Malone is not at all critical of covenant theology in itself, but he believes that the scriptures teach important discontinuities. He writes, Unified with the Old Testament covenants of promise, the new covenant fulfillment holds a true diversity in its administration. That diversity is revealed by a change in the Abrahamic covenantal relations in the new covenant and by heightened individual covenantal responsibility. By a change in covenantal relations, Malone means that the Abrahamic covenant dealt with family relationships, while the new covenant deals with an individual relationship with God and the covenant member. And, critically, while entrance into the Abrahamic covenant was by birth, that is, 
All that was required to receive the covenant sign was to be born. Entrance into the new covenant is only by new birth. This, more than any other reason, is why Malone says the New Testament supports the baptism of disciples alone. What he calls the distinctive stipulations of the new covenant means that only those who express faith in Jesus, only those who have been born again, are truly considered members of the new covenant, and only those should be baptized. Malone highlights an issue here that has puzzled me as well in the defense of some who hold to paedo-baptism. That is, the position really introduces a third category into scripture. We have those who do not believe, those who believe, and those who do not believe and yet have received baptism, and for that reason should be considered covenant members. What this means is that one is in the covenant, in the church, and yet not redeemed, not born again. This category is one that is foreign to the New Testament. Malone has a chapter comparing circumcision and baptism because this, too, is a frequent argument in favor of pedo baptism But here, too, Malone shows that circumcision was always meant to represent the inward work of the Spirit in the heart. Given this, and the previously mentioned differences between the Abrahamic covenant and the New Covenant, relying on circumcision as a pattern is not really a good argument. This leads to another argument that should resonate with those who hold to Reformed theology, that of the normative principle versus the regulative principle. The normative principle holds that whatever is not explicitly forbidden in Scripture is allowed. The regulative principle, on the other hand, says that we need an explicit scriptural command or example to justify why we should practice something. Given this, says Malone, paedo-baptism fails that test. And indeed, many who hold to paedo-baptism will acknowledge this to be true, but then fall back on the good and necessary consequence argument, or insist on more continuity than Malone believes is warranted. And I share Malone's view on that. Now, since Malone is himself a former paedo-baptist, he is aware of all the arguments presented to defend the position. He devotes a chapter to answering the usual proof texts and also to answering the charge that we should not reject children or deny them blessings. Most of these are rhetorical arguments only. Credo Baptists believe their children are in no less a position of blessing because they are born into a home with believing parents. And this blessing is in no way contingent on the child being baptized. Indeed, Paul's argument about children being holy rather than unclean makes no mention of baptism, but it says they are holy, set apart, because of the believing parents they have. Finally, Malone also tackles the argument of tradition, which says that it is a dubious claim that the whole church got it wrong for so many hundreds of years while infant baptism was the rule. One who holds to the authority of Scripture should see the weakness of that argument, there must be scripture to support a position, no matter what history tells us. Indeed, those who hold to Reformed doctrine would have no trouble saying for hundreds of years the church had justification wrong. The book ends with some appendices that are related topics, book reviews, and what the proper mode of baptism is. If you hold to covenant theology, I think because of Malone's history as a Pado baptist and one who holds firmly to covenant theology, his arguments are worth considering. Finally, a word about the importance of baptism and what it means if believers disagree on this. First, it is not the case that disagreement on baptism means breaking fellowship with others. I think it's healthy to hold the same position on baptism that your local church teaches. But for those you encounter elsewhere, fellow believers who belong to Christ and yet don't hold the same position as you do on the question, let it not be a reason for strife. In an interview on the topic several years ago, Stephen Wellham, a professor at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, said this, The debate between Reformed Pado-Baptists and Believer Baptists is, thankfully, not a gospel debate. Between Credo and Pado-Baptists, there is much that unites us, and we can be grateful for those agreements and our unity in Christ. But Wellham goes on to say, to get baptism wrong is not a benign issue. It not only misconstrues our Lord's command and instruction to the church, it also leads to a misunderstanding of elements of the gospel 
particularly to the beneficiaries of the new covenant and the nature of the church. I agree with Wellam on both points, and so I commend Malone's book for your consideration. Thanks for listening.